Mr. Iwata is gone, but it will be years before his impact on both Nintendo and the full video game industry will be fully appreciated. He was a strong leader for our company, and his attributes were clear to most everyone. Intelligence, creativity, curiosity, and sense of humor. But for those of us fortunate enough to work closely with him, what will be remembered most were his mentorship, and especially, his friendship. He was a wonderful man. Reggie fils On July 16th and 17th of 2015, despite storms from Typhoon Nenka, more than 4,000 people attended the funeral of Satoru Iwata. It spoke volumes about the man. On the surface, he was the president of Nintendo, but for those who knew him, he was much more. A programmer, a gamer, a leader, a husband, a father, a friend. During his life, Iwata had so many accomplishments, it seems unbelievable. His knowledge of programming was unmatched, and he routinely saved games that were stuck in development. He became a president in his 30s, handpicked by the most powerful man in the industry, despite having little experience. But Iwata's greatest achievement was challenging the notion that video games weren't for everyone. He tore down walls and introduced games to a whole new audience, even when others doubted him. His philosophy was best summed up when he stated, above all, video games are meant to be just one thing, fun, fun for everyone. This is the life of Satoru Iwata. He was born in Sapporo, Japan, the largest city on the island of Hokkaido on December 6, 1959. His father was Hiroshi Iwata, a prefectural official who wanted nothing more than to see his son follow in his footsteps. But Satoru Iwata had other plans. He would read encyclopedias from cover to cover in his spare time. His greatest fear was earthquakes. His favorite food was chukadon, a mixture of rice, fried vegetables, and assorted meats. Iwata was also active in school, serving as student council president, class president, and club president throughout the years, an early sign of his leadership qualities. But one day, on the way to school, Iwata encountered a device that would change his life forever. At the Sapporo subway, a local telephone company set up pay-per-hour computers. It was Iwata's first experience with a computer. Every Sunday, he came back to the subway to play a simple numerical game entitled Game 31. Iwata became fascinated with computers and video games and wanted to learn more. In 1976, as a sophomore in high school, he worked part-time as a dishwasher in order to save up enough money to buy an HP 65, the world's first programmable calculator. Iwata now had the means to make his own games, and his passion was born. My first creation was a baseball game. When I saw my friends playing that game and having fun, it made me feel proud. To me, this was a source of energy and passion. As that passion for games began to blossom, I think my life course was set. After high school, Iwata enrolled at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. Since studying video game design and programming wasn't possible back then, he majored in computer science. Around the same time, an immensely popular arcade game was gobbling up coins around the country. Space Invaders. Iwata loved it, and wondered how he could make something similar. With the money he received as a graduation present, Iwata purchased a Commodore PET 2001 the very first all-in-one computer. His days of programming on a calculator were over. Iwata's love for computers grew by the day. He would disassemble his computer to learn more about the hardware and frequently played games on it with his roommate. Their dorm room became known as Iwata's Arcade. Playing games was fun, but Iwata wanted to learn more by sharing creations with other programmers. However, due to the cost of personal computers, Few people owned one. Iwata was one of only 10 students to own a computer at his college. His thirst for knowledge brought him to the Commodore Tokyo offices, where he befriended an engineer named Yash Terukura. 
Iwata was stopping by my office almost every day after school. He helped me make test programs, sorted my books and floppy disks, and did other minor things. He was helping so that he could obtain news about our new products, as well as technical information not available to the public. He and other students were Commodore groupies. Yash Terakura. Iwata's internship with Terakura at Commodore was valuable. During this time, he created his first official game release, Car Race, a simple racing game for the Pet Users Club. Iwata also helped Terakura with the ROM software for Commodore's Color Pet prototype. But his first big breakthrough came from hanging around, of all places, the local Cebu department store. A group of computer enthusiasts frequently hung out there with the store clerks, sharing programs they stored on cassettes. Iwata was happy to be around like-minded people, bringing in his own creations and offering advice to others. One member of the group who worked at the store took note of Iwata's talents and asked him to join a new company he was forming with some friends, HAL Laboratory. Iwata was still enrolled in school, so he agreed to join part-time. He was the only programmer on staff. People sometimes ask me what I did when I was hired at HAL. I was a programmer and an engineer and a designer and I marketed our games. I also ordered a lot of takeout food, <laughs> and I helped clean up, and it was all great fun. The company of five worked out of a one-bedroom apartment in Akihabara, developing peripherals and software for various systems, including the MSX and the Commodore VIC-20. One of Iwata's works was Star Battle, a clone of the Namco shoot-'em-up game Galaxian. In 1982, Iwata completed his degree at the Tokyo Institute of Technology and happily joined HAL Laboratory full-time. Meanwhile, his father, Hiroshi Iwata, had just won the mayoral election in the city of Muroran. He was not happy with his son's choice. <laughs> a year after joining HAL full-time, Iwata's choice paid off. The Nintendo company was preparing to release a new system known as the Family Computer, or Famicom for short. It cost 15,000 yen, making it significantly cheaper than a personal computer, and it was made to play video games. Iwata was stunned by the Famicom's power and price point. He said, I feel like this is going to change the world. I want to be involved in this, no matter what. As luck would have it, the Famicom contained a modified version of the 6502 processor, a popular CPU that was used in a variety of computers, including Iwata's own Commodore PET 2001. Through connections with HAL Laboratory, Iwata set up an introductory meeting with Nintendo. Engineers at Nintendo were more than happy to give Iwata and HAL Laboratory work. Iwata seemed more familiar with the Famicom than Nintendo's own programmers. It was the beginning of a beautiful relationship. Before the Famicom was released to the public, Nintendo was working on a deal with Atari to distribute the system in other territories. While Nintendo had a strong market presence in Japan, Atari had a much better worldwide presence. The deal stated that Nintendo would create the hardware and software, while Atari would sell and distribute it outside of Japan. Atari also requested that Nintendo program four of their games for the Famicom. One of those games was Joust, the popular arcade game by Williams Electronics, which Atari licensed for home consoles. Thus, Iwata was given his first job from Nintendo, great joust for the Famicom, and have it done in three months. He finished it in two. Unfortunately, the Atari Nintendo deal fell apart, and joust wouldn't be released until four years later. But Nintendo was impressed with Iwata's skills and programming speed. They gave him a new assignment, he had to fix their game Pinball, which had fallen way behind schedule. 
Iwata got it done, and the game was released in February of 1984. As time went on, Iwata was given more projects, including Golf and F1 Race. HAL Laboratory, and especially Iwata, quickly earned the trust of Nintendo's most important figure, President Hiroshi Yamauchi. He invested money into HAL, officially making them a second-party developer. Iwata was promoted, becoming a development manager and a board member for HAL. He was dubbed the Super Programmer. One notable title he worked on was Balloon Fight, a game where you pop enemy balloons to stay afloat. Iwata's programming was so good, the Famicom version of the game ran much smoother than the arcade version. Iwata had found a way to calculate the player's position on the screen much more accurately. Nintendo was amazed, and used the same calculation in the underwater levels of Super Mario Bros. In 1987, HAL Laboratory was working on a racing game for the Famicom, but was having trouble finding a way to make it stand out among the crowd. It was at this time, Iwata would first work with the man he considered his rival, Shigeru Miyamoto. Miyamoto had been with Nintendo since 1977, and created some of their biggest hits, including Donkey Kong and Super Mario Bros. To Iwata, it seemed like everything Miyamoto touched turned to gold. Why does Miyamoto-san always succeed, he would ask himself. Iwata's programming skills were undeniable, but there is a difference between making a game and making a smash hit. Miyamoto took a look at the racing game and thought it, quote, just wasn't fun. With Iwata, they remade courses, added Mario as the main character, and made the game compatible with the Famicom 3D glasses, which made the racing action pop out from the screen. The final result was Famicom Grand Prix 2, 3D Hot Rally, one of only eight games compatible with the glasses. Iwata learned a valuable lesson during that project. Content was king. I found out then that engineering is not quite as important as imagination, he said. From there, a friendship and mutual respect grew between the two developers. It would be the first of many collaborations. By 1991, Howe Laboratory had grown significantly. They now had 90 employees and were building a brand new headquarters in Yamanashi, with a clear view of Mount Fuji. However, all was not well. HAL Laboratory was suffering from a recent lack of hit games, and they had borrowed a significant amount of money to build the new headquarters. To make matters worse, the Japanese economy was going through a difficult time. In total, they owed 1.5 billion yen. Hiroshi Yamauchi, president of Nintendo, agreed to help HAL Laboratory pay back its debt under one condition. Satoru Iwata would be named president of the company. Iwata, who was currently head of development, was hesitant. He had little experience as a manager, but he finally agreed. It isn't a matter of what I like or don't like, he said, but rather when I think that this is the logical thing for me to do, I'm prepared to do it. He quickly prepared himself to lead HAL Laboratory through repaying 250 million yen a year over six years. He was 32 years old. Iwata had the daunting task of leading HAL Laboratory through paying back 1.5 billion yen of debt. But somehow, through all of this, he managed to accomplish things that would define his career as both a programmer and a leader. One of his first jobs was to speak with every single employee at HAL directly. This helped him not only learn more about them, but himself too. Iwata believed the company must have a common goal that everyone could believe in. He led similarly to how he programmed, making decisions by gathering information, analyzing it, and assigning priority. When I did that, he stated, things around me began gradually getting better. Iwata shifted HAL Laboratory's focus to game development. It seemed to offer endless opportunities for learning and growth, and it would be the key to saving the company. Luckily, they had one game that Iwata was excited about, Tinkle Popo. Created by 19-year-old game designer Masahiro Sakurai, it was an action game with universal appeal. 
anyone could play the game and have a good time. But when initial orders for the game only reached 26,000 copies, Iwata grew concerned. He consulted with his old rival, Shigeru Miyamoto. Miyamoto liked the game, but thought the name Tinkle Popo wasn't strong enough. He suggested they rebrand the game and have Nintendo publish it. This was a risk. Iwata would have to cancel 26,000 orders. But he agreed. Higher-ups at HAL were stunned and asked Iwata to reconsider, but he refused. He knew the magic of Miyamoto. The gamble paid off. Tinkle Popo was renamed to Kirby of the Stars, also known as Kirby's Dreamland. The game became a huge hit, selling 5 million copies. Iwata would never forget the success of a game that anyone could pick up and play. In 1993, Shigesato Itoi, a well-known Japanese writer and creator of the Mother franchise, came to HAL Laboratory with a problem. His company, Ape Inc., was busy working on their latest game, Mother 2. However, development was moving too slowly. Itoi was concerned the game might never be finished. He asked Satoru Iwata for help. Iwata took a look at the code and gave his analysis. I don't think you're going to be able to finish if you go on like this, he said. Iwata gave him two options. Either he could take what they had already and fix it in two years, or they could start fresh and be done in six months. The choice was obvious. Rather than solve the issues one by one, Iwata and his team at HAL developed tools that the staff at APE could use that would move development along more easily. In less than a year, they were able to complete the game. For his remarkable help, Itoi referred to Iwata as Superman. Iwata followed up this accomplishment with another, this time by helping Game Freak, the studio behind the Pokemon franchise. Iwata assisted with the western localization of Pokemon Red and Green, so Game Freak could focus on their sequels, Pokemon Gold and Silver. With the sequels, Iwata created graphic compression tools for the developers. This allowed them to include the previous Pokemon titles in the same cartridge, essentially doubling the size of the game. When Game Freak was creating Pokemon Stadium, Iwata was able to port the battle system from the Game Boy games by simply studying the original source code. Game Freak designer Shigeki Morimoto was amazed. What kind of company president is this, he said. It seemed like Satoru Iwata took no days off. Around this same time, he helped Kirby creator Masahiro Sakurai with Super Smash Bros. by programming the game on the weekends. By 1999, Iwata's shift to focusing on game development had paid off. Literally. HAL Laboratory was able to pay back the 1.5 billion yen it owed. Hiroshi Yamauchi couldn't help but be impressed. He offered Iwata a position at Nintendo as the head of corporate planning. For all the help Nintendo provided to HAL during their time of crisis, Iwata felt he owed them one and accepted the position. The next chapter of his career was about to begin. In his new role at Nintendo, Satoru Iwata's job was to create a strategy for making their latest console, the GameCube, a success. Iwata once again focused on game development, establishing new procedures to make development time shorter while maintaining quality. He also encouraged developers to come up with new ways to play games. Shigeru Miyamoto, now a co-worker of Iwata, took the challenge to heart, trying to find ways to make the handheld Game Boy Advance interact with the GameCube. Even with all of these responsibilities, Iwata still found time to do what he loved. During the development of Super Smash Bros. Melee, he helped debug the game so it could be released on time. He loved being, quote, in the trenches. In Iwata's first two years as head of corporate planning, Nintendo saw increased profits. However, the GameCube was still struggling against Sony's PlayStation 2. In May of 2002, Hiroshi Yamauchi called Iwata into his office. Iwata thought he was being fired. Instead, Hiroshi Yamauchi told him he was planning to retire. He wanted Iwata to become the next president of Nintendo, a position that had never been held by anyone outside of the Yamauchi family. 
The reason for Iwata-san's selection comes down to his knowledge and understanding of Nintendo's hardware and software. An executive, regardless of his vast successes, is fundamentally an executive who doesn't intimately understand our products. Over the long term, I don't know whether Iwata-san will maintain Nintendo's position or lead the company to even greater heights of success. At the very least, I believe him to be the best person for the job. Hiroshi Yamauchi. It was now up to the 42-year-old Satoru Iwata to lead Nintendo into the future. His first task was to come up with a plan to get Nintendo back on track. They dominated the handheld market, but saw decreased home console sales year after year. Said Iwata, If we continue down the same path as we have in the past, people may become tired of gaming. He concluded that the video game industry was becoming more and more exclusive. The creation of new, technologically advanced video game systems had driven a huge gap between experienced players and beginners. Something had to be done to draw people back in. He recalled his work on Kirby's Dreamland and how making a video game that was easily accessible resulted in great sales. The philosophy of keeping things simple and fun for everyone would be Awata's strategy. Deviating away from what everyone else was doing would be a huge risk. But Iwata was determined. Creators only improve themselves by taking risks, he said. Nintendo's first big decision came during a business lunch between Iwata and Miyamoto in the spring of 2003. The topic was Nintendo's next handheld console. Before departing, former president Hiroshi Yamauchi casually quipped that the next handheld should feature two screens, similar to the old Game & Watch handhelds from the 80s. Although he was now his boss, Iwata trusted Miyamoto more than anyone and wanted his input on new hardware. Miyamoto suggested one of the displays be a touchscreen, which could be used for controls. The other screen could display the action. Iwata loved it, and the basis for the Nintendo DS was born. Unveiled later that year in November, public reaction was mixed. Sony, who had just teased their upcoming PlayStation Portable, wrote it off as a gimmick. When it was released a year later, sales were slow, but Satoru Iwata was convinced that Nintendo made the right move. To go along with their new hardware, Iwata produced a game to appeal to a new audience, Brain Age. Based on Dr. Kawashima's popular Train Your Brain books, the game contained simple math and reading exercises to stimulate neural activity. Miyamoto produced a game of his own, a pet simulation game called Nintendogs. Word started to spread on the Nintendo DS, and skepticism about the system vanished. The DS sold 13 million units in 14 months. That number would have been higher if Nintendo could have kept up with the demand. Iwata's instincts were correct. With success in the handheld market, Iwata wanted to move his strategy to home consoles. Genyo Takeda, who had his hand in every Nintendo home console up to that point, was put in charge. Iwata asked him to go off the roadmap, to focus on innovation rather than new technology. They needed a system that the whole family could enjoy. They gave it the codename Revolution, an appropriate title for the system that would change video games. The final product was eventually dubbed the Nintendo Wii. Hardware-wise, it was basically an enhanced GameCube. The innovation came with the controller, which utilized motion controls. Packaged with the system was Wii Sports, a perfect title to show off Nintendo's new technology. Today there are people who play and who don't. We'll help destroy that wall between them, Iwata said. Once again, critics were skeptical. And once again, Iwata was right. The Nintendo Wii was a resounding success, selling 20 million units in just over a year. For the first time since the 90s, Nintendo was number one in the video game market. Satoru Iwata had to convince not only Nintendo, but the entire industry to believe in his idea that gaming should be less exclusive. In only four years, he had succeeded. He infused his vision into workplace culture, merging divisions to encourage collaboration, and regularly meeting with employees. 
During his tenure, Iwata made several changes to open up the doors of Nintendo and share their knowledge and love of games with the world. In 2003, in order to gather more data, he created Club Nintendo, a reward program that allowed gamers to earn prizes in exchange for taking short surveys. In 2006, he launched Iwata Asks, a series of text and video interviews with developers at Nintendo, hosted by Iwata himself. It provided never-before-seen information and unique insight on game development, something Nintendo usually kept under wraps. In 2011, Iwata launched Nintendo Direct, a video series that detailed news and announcements from Nintendo. It was a chance for the public to see the president's fun personality. You are very busy now, since there are so many games featuring Luigi, huh? What? じゃあ、これを、あ、宮本さんもかぶってください。準備していただいてありがとうございます。はい、これで2人でルイージブラザーズになりました。It looks like I'll be delivering the first Nintendo Direct of 2014 directly to you. He would regularly speak at conferences and do media interviews, something his predecessor rarely did. It was clear to everyone that Satoru Iwata was more than just a president of a company. On my business card, I am a corporate president. In my mind, I am a game developer. But in my heart, I am a gamer. In 2009, with Nintendo riding high on the success of the Nintendo DS and Wii, development began on the next wave of systems. For handhelds, Iwata wanted to further explore the world of 3D gaming, having worked on it previously with Miyamoto in 3D Hot Rally. Nintendo experimented with 3D ever since. In 1995, they released the Virtual Boy, a system that resembled a pair of goggles that simulated 3D gaming with a red tint it wasn't successful. Nintendo experimented more on 3D displays with the Game Boy Advance and the Nintendo GameCube, even going so far as to modify the game Luigi's Mansion to utilize it. But these ideas never made it past the research and development stage. Iwata was still encouraged by the technology, however, and pushed forward with development on a new handheld that would use 3D displays. What resulted was the Nintendo 3DS, Released in early 2011, the handheld could display 3D effects without the need of special glasses. The technology was impressive. Sales were not. In the second quarter alone, the 3DS only sold 710,000 units worldwide, way under expectations. Hardware sales across the company were down as well, as the Nintendo DS and Wii became older. Iwata slashed the 3DS price drastically, from $249 to $169 in order to entice gamers. With profits declining, Iwata felt personally responsible. Not wanting to lay off employees, he slashed his salary in half. In 2012, Nintendo followed up the Wii with its successor, the Wii U. It featured HD graphics, improved online connectivity, and a tablet controller. But once again, sales were disappointing Many consumers were confused by the name, thinking it was some sort of add-on for the original Wii, rather than a brand new system. Nintendo also continued to focus on family-friendly software, a market that the tablet and cell phone industry had since dominated. When asked if Nintendo would begin making games on mobile devices, Iwata stated, absolutely not. When asked why, he responded, if we did this, Nintendo would cease to be Nintendo. For the 2011 fiscal year, Nintendo reported $461 million in losses. It was their first loss in more than 30 years. For the 2012 and 2013 fiscal year, Nintendo experienced their second and third consecutive operating loss. While the 3DS was selling better, the Wii U was failing to catch on with consumers. Something had to change. As he so often did before, 
Iwata handled the problem like a programmer. If the system doesn't work, it's definitely your fault, he said. Iwata took full responsibility for the decline in sales and enacted changes to put Nintendo back on track. He took over as CEO of Nintendo of America and killed the expensive E3 presentations in favor of the online Nintendo Direct videos. In order to drive up software and hardware sales, they would focus on releasing games from their strongest franchises, including Pokemon, Mario Kart, and Super Smash Bros. In June of 2014, Nintendo announced the Amiibo toy line, which could connect to Nintendo games and provide additional content. With these changes, things began to look better for the company. In the summer of 2014, during a routine physical examination, Iwata was given bad news. Doctors found a growth in his bile duct, a form of cancer. He quickly underwent a successful surgery to remove the growth. Due to his medical issues, he announced that he would miss the annual shareholders meeting. When he reappeared in public later that year on November 5th, he was noticeably thinner, but in good spirits. Nintendo's software and hardware sales were improving, and the Amiibo toys were becoming hard for stores to keep in stock. In 2015, after three years of operating loss, Nintendo announced they had returned to profitability. Iwata continued to shake things up by announcing a partnership with mobile developer DNA in March of 2015. One analyst described the move as the most drastic, bold shift in strategy Nintendo could have undertaken. Iwata had finally recognized the legitimacy of mobile gaming. In June of 2015, gamers eagerly anticipated the E3 Expo, the annual convention where game companies, including Nintendo, usually made their biggest announcements. But before the event started, Nintendo announced that Satoru Iwata would not be attending for the second straight year. Iwata stated it was no cause for concern, as there was no new hardware to announce and he had business to deal with in Japan. Later that month, he attended a shareholders meeting, where they re-elected directors and discussed the distribution of surplus profits. Two weeks later, on July 11th, Satoru Iwata passed away at the age of 55. The cancer had returned. In a previous column, I wrote that when someone passes on, for those around them, it's simply as though a character has been removed from their story. But for the deceased, the entire world has gone away. However, even for other people, Mr. Iwata's presence was too great to simply call him a character in the story of life. Mr. Iwata's world is gone, leaving a massive impression on those around him. Yet, even so, our world continues. Masahiro Sakurai when I'm parting with a friend, regardless of the circumstances, I find it best to just say, see you later. We'll meet again. After all, we're friends. That's right, nothing unusual about it. I'll see you later. You went on a trip far, far away, even though it was planned for many years from now. You wore your best outfit and said, sorry for the short notice, though you didn't say it out loud. You always put yourself last after you'd finished helping everyone else. You were so generous as a friend that this trip might be your very first selfish act. I still can't grasp what's happened. It feels like I could still get a lighthearted email asking me out to lunch at any moment. After you made sure lunch wouldn't disrupt my schedule, of course. You can invite me out whenever you want. I'll invite you too. So for now, let's plan on meeting again. You can call me up whenever you like and I'll give you a call too. I still have a lot to talk to you about, and if I come up with any particularly good ideas, I'll let you know. So let's meet again. No, I suppose we're already meeting. Right here, right now. Shigisato Itoi Iwata's death was a shock to everyone. The outpour of emotion online following his death was an indicator of how important he was to the industry. It came from everywhere. Executives, employees, rival companies, developers, and gamers. Their words varied. Visionary, leader, 
inspiration, mentor, legend. His legacy on the video game industry cannot be overstated. Time and time again, Iwata redefined what it meant to be a developer and a leader. When games were in development crisis, he saved them. When a company was on the verge of crumbling, he built it back. When things got bad, he took responsibility. And he did it all with a heartwarming smile. Satoru Iwata embodied what Nintendo is all about. That video games are meant to be just one thing. Fun. Fun for everyone.